Now, there's symbolism in everything that happens and has happened, not only in Christian worship, but Jewish worship as well as other types of worship. Um, and so what we're going to be talking about here tonight, because we only have a finite amount of time, is the symbolism in this building and the symbols that were incorporated uh, sometimes knowingly and sometimes by accident. And how does it happen by accident? Well, it happens by accident that you're copying something from another church or another building that has been seen. I don't know that that's the case. Roy um, was a, a preacher's kid, Roy Johns, that's, that uh, designed this sanctuary. And he's been, this. I do understand that this is the culmination of some of the most beautiful churches in our state all come together in this facility. I don't know that that's the case, but to me it is the most beautiful in the conference. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, first of all, <clears throat> this building and its shape. It is a rectangular shape, and that is from the English tradition. Uh, where do we come from? You know, there's so much, there's just so much to say and to tell you. So here's how we're going to work this out. Tonight, just the symbols in this room. Uh, next week, where do we come from? as Methodist and, and our church lineage and tradition. Uh, the following week, the church year and the liturgy, portions of the liturgy. What is the liturgy? That's the order of worship. Uh, liturgy simply means work, our work. Uh, and that, uh, that's where that comes from. And then the last one, we will be right before Thanksgiving. So we're gonna talk about Advent and Christmas decorating okay so just tonight I'm gonna have to delve into next week's a little bit where do we come from you didn't know this is gonna be a pop quiz did you <laughs> where do we come from well I'll tell you we come out of the Anglican Church the Church of England where does the Anglican Church come from the Catholic Church. Why is that? Because somebody wanted a divorce, right? So he took it upon himself and he uh, formed the Church of England so he could get a divorce. Okay, from the from Church of England we go to the Catholic Church. We were all Catholic. Okay, what about before that? Mm -hmm. Before Catholics. Well, you need to come on over to the center anyway, because you're too far away. <clears throat> okay, so Methodism comes from the Anglican Church, Church of England. Church of England comes from the Catholic Church by way of a divorce, or seeking a divorce. The Catholic Church comes from where? Okay. The original church was the Orthodox Church, okay? Uh, it was called the Eastern Church, because where did the church originate from? Where is, where did it all originate from? Jerusalem, Israel, where is that? Middle East. So it was called the Eastern Church. And so uh, we're coming out of this. Where did we, uh, the early Christians uh, would have been out on the hillsides? They would not have been Christians, would they? They would have been Jews. Uh, they would have gone to the temple for worship or the synagogue for, for learning. And then they would, uh, this is after the crucifixion and resurrection, they would have had to meet secretly because why? They were outlaws, correct? Jesus was considered a criminal 
and was crucified as such. So um, those early Christians were in, in, in places and they would meet in places that were hidden and there had to be a code, a secret language for them to know who was who and where to go. And that's where the symbols come in. And most of those symbols you find in the Chrismon tree. We don't call it a Christmas tree. It's a Chrismon tree because it's a Christian monogram uh, that are hung on it, Christian monograms. And those are the symbols from the early church, the cross, the fish, the uh, grapes, a chalice, um, a triangle, a circle, various things. And one of the things that, um, you know, of course the fish is the famous, the cross, the cross is the most famous, but the fish is, uh, was very easy to hide from the authorities because if you were out, you know, in the empire and you were visiting with somebody, and they kind of suspected that you might be Christian and you're standing there, you know, shooting the breeze and they make an ark in the dirt. If you went back and connected and made the ark the other way, they knew you were a Christian. And so, you know, and if you didn't, they knew, okay, well, I'm just making stuff in the dirt, you know. So we see, we see a lot of these, um, symbols in this building. You, some, of, some of them you can see that are obvious. The windows here are obvious, okay? But uh, the rose window is not so obvious, okay? So we have in this building, the original buildings would have been of the earliest church, would have been a home church. And the earliest home church is found in Jerusalem I think it's from the second century AD and it's simply a baptismal pool and a lectern for the scripture to be on. Now back then they didn't have a Bible. There were scrolls or mainly it was word of mouth, you know, passed orally. And so even until, it wasn't until the third which was the fourth century, this all gets confusing, uh, 312 in that vicinity that Constantine, who was fighting, he was the emperor of Rome, or one of the uh, three that were in charge of Rome, he was fighting to take Rome. And he, uh, you know, the Christians had been persecuted and persecuted and persecuted. And he saw this sign and the sign was the Chi Rho, supposedly, cross with the Chi Rho on it. What is the Chi Rho? Chi Rho. Joey, come down here. I need you to get back here where the pyramids are, and I think it's on the white pyramid, just like the one we would put on the, my assistant, Joey Gardunio. Um, so the Chi Rho is the first Chi, it looks like a P with an X, is the first two letters of Jesus in uh, Greek. And so it was a monogram. That was one of the other symbols that they would do that. Because, you know, Cairo, what does that mean? Um, and so supposedly this is the symbol. Here we go. This is the symbol with a cross in it that would run up and down like this that Constantine saw. And it said, <clears throat> the voice said, in this sign conquer and so he had that emblazoned of all of the shields and he won and so he turned the roman empire christian that later became known as the byzantine empire and it was then in 11 700 to 1100 that there was a schism and the church split. We've been split in a long time. Uh, and so the church split. The East became the Orthodox Church, as we know, Greek, Syrian, Russian Orthodox Church, and, and moved to Constantinople. That's where the Byzantine Empire was, which is now Istanbul. And um, the, the 
West went to Rome because uh, he conquered in Rome. And so there the schism came. And so they have a little bit different theologies now. Uh, the Greek Orthodox Church like to say that they are the original and they have remained true. And that's, for the most part, correct. Uh, Rome moved uh, in a different direction and not as true as the Greek or uh, the Orthodox traditions. So, but where is the original church as we would know it by looking today? Any ideas? Egypt. The Coptic church is the most authentic early Christian church. So, a little bit something for you to go study on. Um, so what would have happened? The early church, that first church building, really wasn't a building. It was in somebody's home in the basement. Uh, and it was hidden. It was just a baptismal pool, all beautifully decorated with paint and everything, and a lectern. And so we come into once churches began being built, you know, when the Roman Empire fell, the, church, uh, the building that was most prevalent was the basilica, it was no longer being used. The basilica was a long rectangle building, kind of like this one. But in the far end from the door, there was a semicircular apse, A-P-S-E, apse. I'm not saying a wordy dirt. And that would have been where the governor or prelate or whatever, whoever was the, the uh, high up muckety muck, would have sat to hear, you know, disputes and whatever. Well, uh, that became the seat of the altar because the altar harkens back to the temple where you made sacrifice. And so in the early church, they were heavily focused on sacrifice and that, that Jesus was sacrificed for us, which he was. He accepted that. And the altar, you know, was the sacrificial place. Well, the apse would be back where the organ is. That's, that's in that era. Don't, don't get confused. So we, we move up in later, then they start adding a cross piece across, uh, transepts they're called, and some churches, you, you'll see most Catholic churches today have that transept, that the church is uh, in the shape of a cross. And yeah, Episcopal um, Church of England. Most liturgical churches, and liturgical means that they follow the tradition, the ancient traditions of the worship order and so most liturgical churches will be, uh, you will find with the long central access, sometimes a cross piece, you know, Catholic churches. Uh, of course, our Greek Orthodox Church does not have that. But if you go to a big city in like Dallas, for instance, um, the Greek or Orthodox Cathedral there is in the shape of a Latin cross. I mean, it's perfectly even. It's a beautiful church. Highland Park, yeah. A lot of Methodist churches are old, older Methodist churches. So uh, we, we move up today to this building. And we're in a basilica shape minus the apse. Because, where do we come from? The Anglican Church, Church of England. They, there aren't too many apse in Anglican churches. What you find is a wall with an altar on it. And then you'll find a communion table out in front of that. So sometimes you see the communion table come out if we have too much going on on the altar. This is actually an altar right here. Can you see my little red dot? This is an altar. Uh, Larry didn't like to call it, Larry Stafford didn't, he called it a communion table. It's an altar. 
It has horns on it on the side. You see right there the horns? It has the uh, seven panels. The seven panels are reminiscent for us to remember the temple, the Holy of Holies, with the seven-branched menorah. That's where that comes from, right there, seven, num the number seven. Numbers are very important. The number three, the number two, the number one, the number seven. Can you think of any other numbers? Twelve. All these are very important. Numbers are very important. Um, so here in the beginning, we're just going to talk about these symbols. The reason we have stained glass and the reason symbols began to be used so much was because the early Christians, not many people, were literate. Not many people at all were literate. And so they had to teach them some way, and they had to spread the word some way. So it was done through pictures. It was done through symbols. It was done through the telling of stories. Uh, there were no Bibles walking around under people's arms. You know, they were, the scriptures were only in certain areas. And it wasn't until uh, 312 that Constantine officially started the church that a Bible was begun to be put together. So a lot of the books that were circulating or the scrolls that were circulating at that time uh, were deemed redundant, I suppose is the word, because they all were similar. And so they chose the ones that were most complete. The first four books of the New Testament we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are references in this building all over the place for the number four. Can you see where any of those are? Up here in the windows, there are sets of four windows. That's the Gospels. It's not necessarily telling you it's the Gospels because it's, the windows are all telling you a story. But also in those windows is a hidden symbol of the Gospels. In this room, the upper story is the New Testament because the light hits that first. The Old Testament is on the bottom. Normally, wherever the light is the brightest in a church, a cathedral, that will be New Testament. Where it's not so bright will be the Old Testament. Okay, so in here, we have a central axis. On this central axis, we believe, as Methodists, in two sacraments, baptism and Holy Communion. And so what you see is the altar here in the middle where Holy Communion, the host for Holy Communion, are found uh, when we have communion. Notice we don't have a tabernacle and keep it in here all the time because it isn't our tradition to... Uh, hold transubstantiation as the focus of it. Transubstantiation means that the blood and the body actually turn to blood and flesh, the, the wine and the, and the bread. Consubstantiation means that the essence of it changes. And then I can't remember the other one, but it's just a symbol. So we as Methodists are somewhere in the last two. The essence changes, it's still bread and juice, but the essence of it changes. And then most of us who've come from other uh, denominations will say, oh, it's just a symbol. So we don't keep it in here uh, because, you know, it's not, we don't consider it flesh and blood. Okay. Um, so we have the baptismal font here, again, on the central axis of the room. So... The two sacraments are here. If you look in the window up here, and it may be difficult for some of you to see, and I don't think this is going to work. Can you see it? Okay, in the center you see the red cross. Okay. You see right behind the cross, okay, there's a white circle. It's just going away, isn't it? Uh, and then right under the bottom of that white circle, that's the bread you see another sort of cup kind of thing. And then if you look on either side of the cross, it kind of goes out in a, you know, at a flared kind of, that's a chalice. 
Can you see it? Okay, then you go on out, you see the red that circles out to the edge? That is a clamshell. Baptism, the symbol, the symbol for baptism. So it's kind of difficult to see, but you can, if you stand back, you can see that it actually is a clam, clamshell. Okay, radiating out from that are the red rays. You see that? The red rays all the way out to the edge. That is a symbol of Pentecost and the glory of the Lord. Uh, the Holy Spirit was poured onto those at Pentecost, the beginning of the church, and uh, where they could all speak the languages of the whole world. The central window is a circle. The circle is the symbol of God. It is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning, the end. There are four circles within that. Four circles are the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in each one is a star because they witnessed the life of Christ from the birth. Well, they didn't witness the birth. I don't, some of them might have been there. I don't know. Altogether, that's called a quatrefoil. Four circles together, a quatrefoil. If it were three, then it would be called a... Yeah. Trifold. Trifold. Okay, so right here, you look up, and, and Brian sort of stole the thunder on that Sunday, but you look up, and the early uh, Christians, the disciples, were fishermen. And, of course, uh, we look up, and we see the bottom of the boat. Uh, the, yeah, the, uh, not a keel, but... That centerpiece that runs through, that's, you know, the symbolism of the boat. You see the edge on the side. Some of the early churches later, um, when the, you know, disciples were going out to spread the word, they would just turn their boats upside down and put walls on them. And that's where that comes from a lot of times. Um, so you see, it's kind of hard with all these lights to see that. This is called the nave the nave, which means ship. And the nave, you've heard of that in the Navy, naval. Um, so this is the nave where the people are, the nave. Uh, this is called something different. Once you get to this place right here, you're no longer in the nave, even though you really are. But this is not a stage. We don't have stages in church. That's, that's a, a public building that has that. This is called a chancel. And a chancel is where you would find an altar and the appointments for worship. What are appointments for worship? Well, you have a lectern, which is where the Bible should be read from. This is where all the scripture should be read from. You have a pulpit where the word is proclaimed and then you have all this other stuff. You have an altar, you have a cross, you have candles. Uh, when, when there's two candles present, a candle or a flame signifies uh, divine presence, divinity. All throughout history, where there was a fire, the divine was present. In the wilderness, what was present at night? I think this is going out. What was present at night? A column of the flame of, uh, the, and, and during the day it was a cloud, right? And so wherever you see fire in a holy place, that's the symbol of the presence of God. And here we have two on the altar. If there were only two, this signifies Jesus' uh, divinity and humanity. Where you see four, and when we process and we're bringing in the light of Christ, when they come down front and you've got the four here, it's a symbol of the Gospels. Thank you, dear. You get an extra prize tonight. Um, we also have in here a very large candle that sometimes is lit and sometimes is not. This is called a Paschal candle. 
And the Paschal candle stands for life and rebirth, our birth and rebirth. So it's lit for baptisms, and then it's lit for funerals, because a funeral is rebirth into the heavenly world. Over here, we have the processional cross, which leads in, and then we have this, which is the Christ candle from the Advent wreath. The Christ candle is lit. Um, we talk about the Prince of Peace. And so this is here to remind us to pray for peace every day, not just Christmas. Christmas Eve. So we light this on Christmas Eve when it's in the Advent wreath. Okay. Trinity symbols. We believe in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There are Trinity symbols all over this place. You are sitting in Trinity symbols. If you look at the ends of the pews, you see um, right here, can't hold my hand still. Right here, there's an arch. An arch is a stylized form of a triangle the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in this arch, you also have two other little uh, arches or, or uh, symbols of the triangle. And so the big arch and then the other two, all of it together creates uh, a double trinity symbol. Where do you see that in other places? Right here, main arch. Two others, all together, three. You see it on the pulpit, you see it on the lectern. You see it where else? On the organ, the windows. Lots of symbols going on in here. You see it in the back, okay. Um, you see it on the chairs, the pulpit chairs over here. It's just nothing but um, Trinity symbols and um, I mean because they're a set of three that's a Trinity symbol um, there's a larger chair in the middle anybody got an idea what that why is that it's for the bishop that's the bishop's chair when the bishop comes to church so can anybody sit there yeah that we're not like the other places that have bishops. We don't, you know, well, get too carried away with it. But no, she doesn't get around very often. Uh, it's been a really hard two years <laughs> you know, for all of us. But these are the chairs, chairs from the old church downtown, I'm told. And so they are more um, gothic in style. This building is a gothic, is a modern gothic, gothic design, which is what Roy told me. Um, and so, you know, it kind of harkens to the old church downtown, but not really. I've been told, I've never seen the inside of the old church. I've just seen things from the old church. Those chairs, um, the, the old pulpit, which is down in the choir room, um, is very gothic, beautiful. Um, high Victorian Gothic, though. Um, any other questions before I move on? I don't want to keep you too late. You notice that around the room we have pictures. My thing, these pictures. These are the stations of the cross. You see, most of the, most of the time you will find these at a Catholic church. Well, Mary Frances Perry was just dead for us to have these and it never uh, materialized in her lifetime. And when she passed, her children said, we want to give those to the church. And so this is a gift of the Perry family in memory of Mary Frances. And um, the Stations of the Cross, I believe number one's over here. Or is it? I can't really see. Well, you have to look, and it just is not all biblical, but it's the, the way of the cross, basically. Um, and so we haven't had, we did a Stations of the Cross probably about 28 years ago. It's been more longer than that. 
and I almost got run off from the church because I built a screen and mounted it to the back of the altar and we flashed images on it of the Stations of the Cross. But somehow that kind of, it turned out okay and everybody was all right with it, so I'm still here. <laughs> you notice there are flowers in here. Um, flowers are an Anglican thing. Uh, because in the Roman church, they didn't, uh, back then, they didn't use flowers. In the Greek Orthodox church, they didn't use flowers because you shouldn't cut what God has um, allowed to live outside and bring in for beauty. And so that's a thing that, that has come through the years, and even the Catholic church now uh, does allow them in. I'm not so sure about the Greek Orthodox church if they allow flowers in the building anymore or now, but... Um, the flowers that you see are usually all artificial that I have done because it's so costly to put fresh flowers in here. It's about $300 for two arrangements, and that's a small arrangement. So because the room is so big, it just requires so much. To, so uh, over the years, several have given money. Uh, please make an arrangement for this or that, and, please, and I have, and we're out of room. Just let you know. Thank you for, for but we're out of room for storage. The choir room looks like a funeral parlor. <laughs> um, but um, we do have, an, I try to do something seasonally for each time in the year when we don't have this. And there are a few, a few people that still will put fresh flowers in. And occasionally I will call Denise and I'll say, it's a special Sunday, nobody's put flowers in. Put something together and send me the bill. I don't pay for it, we have a fund. <laughs> so if you want to put money in the flower fund or the seasonal altar flower fund, uh, you can. All right, the organ. The organ was a project that was kind of dumped in my lap my third day here, which I wasn't really aware. I mean, I knew this would be a great space for an organ. It was designed for an organ and for music. Um, but I wasn't planning on that, and Harry Statham insisted that I come to that first um, finance committee meeting, and they dropped that in my lap. And so thankfully I'd had a course in seminary on what to do if a church needs an organ. So, and I was an organ minor, so I kind of knew, you know, what to look for. The uh, ch church at the time had chosen a, a uh, French Canadian company way back when all this first started, extremely expensive, imported um, from Canada. Any import, uh, when you're talking with something like this, is mega, mega bucks. And it was going to be way over a million dollars back then. And so that's why the organ never happened. But people gave money, and so at that point, we had, I think, 350 or 75,000, and Herschel. <laughs> I uh, said, well, on behalf of uh, the church, we want you to, we got this much money, we want you to find us an organ, a, a real organ. Okay. <laughs> it's like, so we did. Um, this is a Schantz. It's an American company. Uh, Schantz is a German family that has been building organs since the early 1800s. And so it's an American classic as far as the sound but it plays French and German and Italian music as well as English music beautifully. Uh, and as at this date, it is the largest pipe organ, the nicest, finest pipe organ in Northeast Louisiana. Not Shreveport, Northeast Louisiana. That's from Alexandria up. So yay, yay y'all. On the organ, you see the, the symbols. There's the little diamond symbols, which is actually uh, just, they thought it looked good. So I said, okay, put some diamonds on there. You see the, um, the uh, stylized arches in the, the carving of the wood. You see on there, Gloria in excelsis Deo. That comes to us out of the scriptures from when? Angels we've heard on high. Glory in excelsis Deo. Glory to God in the highest. 
And so the committee wanted to make sure that this instrument and everything in this room praised God, even silent. And so even if it's silent, it's praising God, lifting us to God. And everything about this room, uh, the symbolism, the beauty of it, points us or should be pointing us to God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so that's the whole point of the symbols, is that they point us to God. It all points to God. It don't point to the preacher. It don't point to the choir director. It don't point to the person with the biggest hat and the highest heels. It points us to God. So everything in here should point us to God. And that's the... Um, It was designed to host, to house the organ here and an antiphonal division in the back so that it's all on the access, you know, here in the center. The problem with the organ was it was originally designed that only a little bit of it was going to be out here on a shelf. Most of it was going to be back in these chambers. Well, for some reason, thank the Lord, hallelujah, Air conditioning units were put in these rooms and destroyed their use as an organ chamber. And so the organ had to all be put out here in the room, which is the best place for it. So nothing is buried. You know, First Pres, uh, when they were still a church, they got an organ a little bit before this one. It was all buried in two closets. And you could, it was a little bit bigger organ than this one but everything was so overblown and of course when I was in Lufkin Texas before here we had a Cassavant organ which is what the church had originally decided that they were going to get by whoever I think it was D.H. Clark or somebody that was here then uh, that Cassavant well Cassavant is a French uh, organ and it's they're wonderful they're fabulous but they're designed for cathedrals to hang way up away from the people's ears because they're really quite <clears throat> French. <laughs> and so we had one in Lufkin and it was right across from here where I'm standing to the corner of that, where that plant is right there. That's how far away it was from the choir. And it was so loud. Remember that Marilyn? You couldn't hear the choir. And they had gone in and hung blankets on the inside of the organ screen. You could still hear it. But, and it was a huge church. That, that church would seat 2,500 people. If you got out to the third, what, was the, what they called a pew, it was basically a car seat with wooden ends on it. And you could, you know, bounce up and down on them. Um, the pitch dropped. And so the congregation didn't sing because by the time you got to the back row, they were in two or three different keys to the back. It was horrible inside, horrible inside. So um, a cast event I knew was not what this church needed. So anyway, so anyway, the organ, there are 56 ranks of pipes. What is a rank of pipe? A uh, rank of pipes, one sound, one pipe for each key. So there are 80, uh, six, 66 keys per sound, 66 pipes per sound. So it takes a lot of pipes. And yes, every single one of them speaks. There are no dummies, except for me. <laughs> Shantz, S-C-H-A-N-T-Z. They're located in um, Orville, Ohio. The same place as the Smucker plant. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. We had an electronic organ. Uh -uh. You had a, you had an electronic organ that is is uh, it wasn't a pipe organ. It was an electronic organ. It mimicked a pipe organ, but it was a oscillator organ and an oscillator. 
uh, organs were from the 60s, 70s. It was a decent instrument, but it was flat. And the choir always sang flat. This was in 1993. Yeah, it took two years from the start to the beginning. And one of the things, and I'm not going to toot my own horn, but I did pay attention when I was in school as to what you do to put the sounds together. So I, I told, uh, I put this, a list together between me and McCoy Ransom of what the sounds we needed. There are certain sounds on an organ that you must have. They're called diapasons or principles. That is the organ sound. Everything else is mimicked, but that is the sound that cannot be copied by electronic means. They do digital sampling now that comes really, really close. But, um, and, and if you're in a, a good acoustic environment, uh, you might not really be able to tell the average person. I can always tell. It's the curse of having good ears. Um, but anyway, so we designed the organ. I wanted it to be an American classic because it's a sound that does this to you. I didn't want a sound that did this to you when you came in. There's too much of that, too much of that in the world. So it's a warm, rich sound, although it's got the punch if you need it. So if you've been around when I've been on the organ, <clears throat> it's always interesting to see hearing aids coming out. You don't need those things. All right, let's move on. There is uh, any other questions? It's called a narthex. It can also be called a vestibule. And there's also a Latin term for it that's escaping me. I'll look it up for next time. Now, one of the things about this church that you may not know, it was designed for the choir to be back here and all the music from back here in the balcony. That's where music should be performed from, led from, is the balcony. Why? The sound is better, yes, but there's a liturgical reason, a church reason. Worship. Angels on high, I like that. <laughs> um, worship. Huh? No. <laughs> worship is not entertainment. Worship is not entertainment. This turns it into entertainment. I do not like this. I have never liked this, but it sounds okay. But when the choir is up here, it's glorious, glorious. Now, when the organ was being installed, if any of you were around, the choir was back there because we had to be out of the loft. We had the old organ back here, and it was just magnificent, the sound back here, minus the organ. Um, and so occasionally, we'll have the choir sing from back there. It's hard now for some of us to get up and down the stairs. But um, that's where the choir, the music should come from because it's on your behalf as a congregation. They offer what you cannot on your behalf. And so they're not singing for applause. They're singing and making an offering on your behalf to God. And so everything that we do is an offering to God. When we speak, when we sing, when we are singing the hymns, hymns of the church have uh, not always been around um, for you to sing in the way they are. It's from the mid, late 1700s on that hymnology has actually come to fruition. It was done, um, what was sung, the holy songs of the church were the psalms, and um, the uh, liturgy 
would have been sung, especially in the big cathedrals because they didn't have sound systems. And so they chanted. Alleluia. And it would float to the back of the church, you know. Uh, and so everything was sung. It was chanted so that the people could hear it because they're big. You know, you go over to uh, Europe and you go into some of those churches. They're enormous. You can put this church in, you know, 15, 20 times in some of them. So um, anyway, that's just a tidbit. Any other questions? <clears throat> as far as the actual symbols of things, we will get into those more, like the shapes and what they are, the chrismons, on the last time when we have, and I've got a brochure for you for that. Um, and you'll see those on the chrismon tree when it gets put up. And I hate to get into too much of this other because it can cross over real easy. But if you got any more questions in here, I'll answer them. Somebody did ask a question about. Do what? Yeah, it's much better. <clears throat> much better quality of sound up there. Even if you're just sitting watching, you know, something going on down here. One thing I did want to say is that this is an experiment. If you look under your feet, there's carpet. This is an experiment from the 70s that uh, would make the room always acoustically the same, whether there were people in here or not. Because people, we absorb sound. Well, that's a great and wonderful idea, but it doesn't work. Because what it does is it creates uh, the issue of whoever is sitting here, they don't hear the corporateness of the hymn, and so they don't sing. It sucks up the sound. So one of the things in the when we do any renovation or enhancements in here is to get this out from under here. Besides, it's nasty, and it stinks, and there's all kinds of junk in it. And children crawling around on it is not fun. <laughs> now, what is the seating capacity of the church? Uh, this room is 650 without chairs. With chairs, we can get 850 in here, which we did when the organ was uh, dedicated. Diane Bish came. You remember her? Miss Sparkle, Flash, mm -hmm. Diane Bish, the organist. 650 without chairs, just in the pews. That's really liking each other. Balcony as well. And so with, with chairs, we can get 850 in. That's rain. Yes. We're inside the boat, yes. <laughs> What's that? The pyramids? Um, this is a coronation tapestry. Um, I'm not exactly sure where it emanates from. I think England, but I'm not sure. Uh, but this is coronation tapestry. It's red coronation tapestry. This has all of the colors of the Christian year in it. It's got blue and red and green and gold and uh, stylized white in the in the cream, which also goes for white. Uh, it does not have uh, purple, and so during uh, Lent, we removed these. Uh, this was a gift by the Anna Gray No class to the church. Hmm? The, the fringe, yes. kind of white. They are? Mm -hmm. We'll get into that next time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the robes that the ba folks getting baptized across the road, and the, th those robes were the old acolyte robes. And 
I'm surprised that I'm surprised they could get them on. They're all very tiny. All right. Uh, any other questions? I'm trying to think if I've left anything out. Yes, it is unusual. Um, when uh, when you're in most places, um, cathedrals and large churches, the organ console is stable. The organ is what you see up here. That's the instrument. This is just what plays it, the keyboards that play it. And so it moves around, and that was one of the things we wanted to be able to have that ability to move it forever so that you could pull it out here for organ concert or if we had orchestra that required the use of the organ, it could be moved out so that whoever's playing the organ, like the Saint-Saëns uh, Saint organ symphonies, um, which Monroe Symphony um, gave a concert here and did one of the symphonies, and we had it pulled out for that then. And you can see the organist's feet. A lot goes on during church, I can tell you this. It's a workout. <laughs> Uh, to, to play those three keyboards and the feet, especially on All Saints Sunday. For all the saints, it just, that's a wicked, wicked hymn to play. <laughs> you get your exercise. No. All Saints will be on the first Sunday of November. It's usually the first Sunday uh, after all Saints Day, which is November 1st. Okay. Yes, ma'am? At some point, are you going to go into, like, things that can and cannot be done in here or be used in here, like, you know, like having certain music that can't be done in here? Well, as long as it's sacred, it can be done, even if it's drums and guitars and or bongos or... Uh, no, uh, all the music needs to be live. Because worship is live. I mean, if you're playing a recording, that's somebody else. That's not us. So that's why I'm all music. And when, when uh, we have big choir stuff or big you know, stuff, we always have a, a live orchestra because it's important that what we offer to God is real. And if it's a recording, it's not real. Of course, that comes in the question, well, those flowers aren't real. They're real artificial. <laughs> They're real silk. Um, any other questions? I was going to say one other thing, and it's gone out of my head now. Well. I did want to point out something from the old church downtown, which I never saw inside. I saw the outside of it when I was a little tiny thing because my grandmother was in the hospital a lot. And so we would come to, to Monroe and I remember we actually parked in front of the church when I was little. But one of the things is that it was, I'm told, uh, a really beautiful on the inside. I don't know, but from what I've seen of the windows, Margaret Hayes, one of our uh, choir members who's now uh, in the great beyond with the Lord, had saved two windows that had originally, the, the two uh, symbols in the centers of the windows down here in the fellowship hall were taken from, from the old church. I think one is the Bible and one is the Noah's Ark. And she saved them and she had them restored and instead of putting you know a biblical scene she put a fleur-de-lis which is also biblical the fleur-de-lis is the ancient symbol of the house of judah not the star of david it's the fleur-de-lis and so when she passed away i just was thinking and i was thinking out loud and i told scott her son i said look if nobody in the family wants those windows, that would be a fitting memorial to put in the choir room uh, for Margaret and George and also for your grandparents. 
And he thought about it. He said, okay, I think that'd be great because nobody has a house big enough or a window big enough in their house and they're not going to add on to have those windows. And I thought, yes. <laughs> so we got those windows. And if you haven't seen them, they're in the choir room. Those are windows from the, uh, the old downtown church sanctuary. And then uh, I found out that another church member had the door, the window above the door. Thank you, Nancy. My sleuth, she was on it. And we, uh, that was gifted back to the church. It's in the choir room uh, on a table ready to be installed. But these beautiful old windows and things from the old church, you're gonna see a little museum hall kind of thing down there by the choir room because the old pulpit is in the choir room. Um, we're gonna bring the, the, the altar, the altar from downtown is inside the door as you come in, the marble altar. So all the marble things, there's a marble uh, flower stand from the old church going down there. The uh, marble baptismal font is going. And so it's gonna be a little old church memory spot. Uh, mm -hmm. No, it's things that we have from the old church. Yeah, we're going to display them. It's going to be kind of a little museum area, remembering of the old church. Now, if any of you have pictures of the old church downtown inside, I would love to see some of them. And because we have, we have a bicentennial coming up as a congregation in 2026. We will be 200 years old. And so we actually, as a society, are already 200 years old uh, because the society was formed in 1807, I think. Anyway, any other questions? But do just stop by and take a look at those. And when you see Scott or you see Violet Collins, thank them for giving those back to the church. And if you know anybody else that's got an old window from uh, the downtown church. Guilt is a wonderful thing to get them back. <laughs> there used to be a window. Remember we talked about it? It was your part of it. There used to be a, a window from the old church that was in the left hand closet of the choir room. Last time I looked, it was not there. Mm. It's in the prayer room. It's in the prayer room, that particular window. It's a portion. It's a portion. That's the one Nancy got us back. It's It's in the choir room. I had to I had to uh, paint it to because uh, it had been stripped, so I painted it. It's in the choir room, ready to be hung. It says M E Church South. That stands for Methodist Episcopal Church South. It was too many letters to put all in there. 1899. That, that sanctuary was built in 1889. No. Started, yeah. The pew from that sanctuary, I was going to tell you, like, unlike these pews, pews from that era are a rolling edge on it. And that rolling edge is a mimic of a scroll so that when you were sitting in the church, you were sitting in the word of God. That was very prevalent in churches back then. And you still see it today in a few modern recreations of that. All right, I got to go crack my whip down in the choir room. You're welcome to come and sing. Uh, but thank you for being here tonight. Next week we'll go... Uh, through a little bit of the lineage history. If you have any questions from tonight, uh, write them down and uh, bring them back next week. Thank you.